Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. Many of us here in the U.S. tend to see the world through a distinctly American lens, especially in terms of history. It was Ron Swanson that said everything before 1776 was a mistake. And that's kind of a play on the belief that America was the first great republic in the world, the country that led the rest of the world into a democratic form of self-rule. Now, that's not entirely untrue, but it's at best half-true. The Founding Fathers had a long line of nations from which to draw influence when they were writing the Constitution. There were Greece and Rome, of course, but then there were the nearly democratic states in the Holy Roman Empire. There was England's flirtation with self-rule and their following constitutional monarchy, and then there was the Dutch Republic. Our Republic didn't happen in a vacuum. I think it's important to remember, though, that The United States, the early United States, was primarily a maritime nation. Boston and New York, all of our great colonial cities were port cities. The economy here thrived on trade. And here in the Western Hemisphere, a certain culture had emerged. There was a belief among sailors that men on board their ships deserved a vote in their own destiny. Now, officers could choose to ignore that, but that would oftentimes find them thrown overboard with a gunshot through the breast. Now, that attitude started on pirate ships, but almost like an infection, it started touching everything. From merchant ships, to navy ships, to dock workers, to laborers, to even the middle and then the upper classes. Now, of course, the Founding Fathers wouldn't cite Black Sam Bellamy or the colony at Nassau as an influence, and they probably didn't even consider them when they were writing the Constitution, but that idea of every man having a stake and a vote, all of them protected by an agreed-upon document, well, well, that's the pirate life. But however much pirates and democracy and constitutions and revolution might be catching on over on this side of the globe, well, that was all fairly removed from Europe and the centers of real power. Now, most people in Europe looked on to what was happening in the U.S. curiously. They would read their morning papers, and they waited to see how it would all play out. It wasn't until the French had themselves a little revolution and started storming government buildings and chopping off heads that everyone in Europe really stood up and took notice. That was when kings and popes and landlords really started to sweat, and that was when peasants all over Europe started eyeing their pitchforks. Now, all that is to say that the French can get a short shrift here in the U.S. They're the butt of jokes about cheese-eating surrender monkeys and freedom fries. Now, I think that that's a very 20th century prejudice based in the events of World War II and Vietnam. And I think that that's starting to die out. More and more people seem to realize the key role France played in our own revolution. But you still hear that kind of chatter, and I don't really get it. I mean... France was one of the most powerful kingdoms in the world since, well, basically since they clawed their way out of the rubble left behind by Rome. People seem to forget about Charlemagne and Joan of Arc and Napoleon Bonaparte conquering the world. The reason I'm bringing all this up is, well, the French can get a bum rap, and I think they deserve better representation. As do the Dutch, honestly. They were busy overthrowing their foreign monarch and forging a republic decades before anybody else thought of it. And I'm guilty of shortchanging them too. French and Dutch pirates have been all over this story of West Indian piracy so far, but I've always sort of put them in the background, and there's two reasons for that. First, my pronunciation of both French and Dutch is terrible, so I try to avoid it whenever I can to spare your ears. But secondly, English sources are focused more on English pirates, naturally. The primary sources in English tend to mention French or Dutch pirates only when they intersect with English interests, which happened relatively infrequently. But when it did happen, you can be sure that those pirates were so notorious and so feared that the English were forced to pay attention. They were pirates so successful that they threatened to destabilize the whole region. This is episode 50. Violins and Trumpets In January 1681, a French sloop sailed into Bull Bay off the coast of Jamaica. She was exactly the kind of small, fast ship favored by pirates and smugglers and anyone looking to avoid prying eyes. 
Unfortunately, though, someone did notice her lying innocuously at anchor. Word was carried to acting governor Sir Henry Morgan in Spanish Town. It was the ship of a known Dutch pirate named Jacob Evertson. This put Morgan into something of a tight spot. It was his duty to send out a ship to intercept her and investigate. That was his full-time job as lieutenant governor. Henry Morgan, reformed privateer, was bound by oath to hunt down pirates wherever he found them, but wouldn't you know it, there were complications. At the moment, a French armada was bearing down on the West Indies and specifically threatening Jamaica. Spanish Coast Guard flotas were sailing into English territorial waters with impunity and attacking legitimate English shipping. Morgan had declared an armistice with the pirates, an invitation for them to return to Jamaica and receive a pardon, provided they would sail for Jamaica and defend her when the time came. He was offering them something he technically didn't have the power to give, both the pardon and the potential for a privateering commission. But they weren't coming in. Port Royal and Henry Morgan had become dangerous names to the pirates of the Caribbean. Too many men had died at the end of a rope in recent years there in Port Royal for any of them to feel comfortable sailing openly for Jamaica. No one on the account wanted Morgan's pardon. Except, maybe, this ship lying at anchor off the coast. Maybe they were here to accept his commission and sail for Jamaica. If so, it was definitely in Morgan's interest to bring them into the fold. He would put letters of mark in their hands and fill their holds with powder and shot and food and rum, but... Well, they hadn't come to Port Royal. They were hiding out, acting suspicious in a small bay far from the harbor. They were trying to avoid detection, and, well, that made them look very much like outlaws. Now, normally in this situation, Morgan might just ignore them or even send a messenger to offer them a commission. But right now, all eyes were trained directly on him. And it wasn't only because he was governor. He'd recently concluded a lengthy and public legal battle that involved the Lords of Trade and the Privy Council. This was the sort of problem that might find its way to the Duke of York or even the King. But what's more, reports were trickling in all across the world of English pirates in the Southern Ocean, raiding cities, taking ships. It was causing a stir at court, and letters were streaming into Port Royal demanding he do something. Now, exactly what they wanted him to do from Port Royal wasn't clear, but they were making it clear that it was all on his head. He had to do his best to look good here, above reproach. So he, quote, manned a sloop with 24 soldiers and 36 sailors, which at midnight sailed from hence, and about noon came up with him in Bull Bay. Then, letting the king's jack fly, they boarded him. They received three musket shots, slightly wounding one man, and returned a volley, killing some and wounding others of the privateers. Everson and several others jumped overboard and were shot in the sea near shore. End quote. The Jamaican sloop brought back 26 prisoners. They were a mix of mostly Dutch, but a few Spanish pirates. They brought back that pirate sloop as well. They refit the ship for service in the Royal Jamaican Navy. Morgan said that a ship like that would be perfect for hunting pirates. What ship could better chase privateers into their shallow coves and hideouts than a pirate ship? But then Morgan wrote a letter to the Secretary of State back in London. He informed him of the capture and spent some time patting himself on the back for doing just such a stellar job at pirate hunting. And he let the Secretary know very specifically that Captain Jacob Evertson was among those pirates who had jumped ship and been shot to death in the ocean. He wrote, quote, such is the encouragement which privateers receive from my favor, end quote. But then, to avoid alienating the other privateers who might come into Port Royal to serve, he didn't execute those pirates he'd captured. Now, the Spanish were sent on to Cartagena, but the Dutch pirates they captured, well, that bit is left unclear. Now, we might assume they were left to rot in a Port Royal cell, or, well, we might not. Three years later, reports would start coming in of a fleet of French pirates amassed off the Isle of Pines. All of the big names were there, including a Dutch pirate named Jacob Evertson, that very same name that Henry Morgan assured the Secretary of State that he had killed. It was almost certainly the same man, and I'm forced to wonder what actually happened to that Dutch sloop. It was incorporated into the Jamaican fleet, but who crewed her? 
It wouldn't surprise me if it was the very same crew of Dutchmen that Morgan captured, and the ship may have even found her way to the Isle of Pines under Captain Evertson. Morgan's relationship with piracy was as complicated as ever. This Dutch pirate here was the least of his troubles. He'd received word that John Coxon was back in the West Indies, when the governor chased him after leaving the island. William Wright was causing trouble all along the main. He and Thomas Paine, both of them notorious English pirates, had just recently joined forces with some other French pirates and attacked Caracas. Those Englishmen were his responsibility. The lords back in England expected Morgan to do something about them. Now, normally, that wouldn't be an issue. They were small-time raiders, the sort of men who took Indian canoes and fishing ships and didn't raise any major alarms. But those French and Dutch pirates, though, they were causing real trouble, and those English names were gaining prominence because of it. Among the dozens of ships and hundreds of pirates sailing out there, three names stand out. The first name we're going to talk about today is Captain Lorho de Graaf. He was the consummate gentleman pirate. He was always well-dressed. He was tall. He was blonde, and he kept his pointed mustache impeccably trimmed and waxed. But that's not all. He, quote, always carries violins and trumpets aboard with which to entertain himself and amuse others who derive pleasure from this. He is further distinguished amongst flea-busters by his courtesy and good taste. Overall, he has won such fame that when it is known he has arrived at some place, many come from all around to see with their own eyes whether Lorenzo is made like other men. End quote. Lorenzo was the Spanish name for him, but it was only one of many names he carried. He was also known as Lorencillo, El Griff, and Sieur de Baldran. David Marley calls him, quote, the greatest corsair of his day. Henry Morgan called him a great and mischievous pirate, and he was known to the Dutch as Gessel van der Vest, the scourge of the West. Now, he was Dutch, probably born in the seaside city of Dordrecht around 1653. By 21 years of age, he was married, living in the Canary Islands, and working on merchant ships that frequently took voyages to the West Indies. In 1676, the ship on which he was working was impounded by Spanish officials in Havana. The officers were arrested for smuggling and imprisoned, but de Graaf wasn't an officer. He was just a coxswain and a gunner, and here he found himself an unemployed coxswain and gunner. So he took work on a Spanish merchant vessel. It would probably be more accurate to say he was pressed into service, but he was hoping to find his way to Europe and then back home to his wife. But that ship, that Spanish vessel, fell into the hands of buccaneers. He, being a Dutch gunner working on a foreign ship, well, he was then pressed into service on the buccaneer vessel at the age of 24. For a few years he disappeared from the record. He wouldn't reappear until 1679, when the governor of St. Dominique wrote, quote, From a small bark he took a small ship, from this a bigger one, until at last there came into his power one of twenty-four to twenty-eight guns, end quote. That ship he was talking about was El Tigre. She was, before de Graaf acquired her, a small warship sailing with the Armada de Barlovento, it was one night, under cover of darkness, that de Graaf sneaked in and stole her out from under the noses of the entire amassed Spanish fleet. He made himself Captain Lorho de Graaf and continued sailing, but he wouldn't reappear again from the mists of history until 1682, when... Well, we'll get to that part. I should note, though, that there are conflicting descriptions of him physically. Paintings and woodcuts often show what appeared to be an entirely different man. Now this could likely be no more than the mythology surrounding him. But the written record differs as well from people who actually saw him. Sometimes he was tall and blonde. Sometimes he was dark and swarthy. Sometimes he was a biracial pirate escaped from slavery. Now it's just speculation on my part, but I think it's very likely that there wasn't just one single Lorho de Graaf. His career was long, and it was varied. He did a lot of different types of work. And we're going to be talking about him for some time from here on out. I think it's possible we might be seeing what I'm choosing to call the Dread Pirate Roberts effect. Remember from the Princess Bride? I am not the Dread Pirate Roberts, he said. My name is Ryan. I inherited this ship from the previous Dread Pirate Roberts, just as you will inherit it from me. 
The man I inherited it from was not the real Dread Pirate Roberts either. His name was Cumberbund. The real Roberts has been retired fifteen years and living like a king in Patagonia. Then he explained the name was the important thing for inspiring the necessary fear. You see, no one would surrender to the Dread Pirate Wesley. So we sailed ashore, took on an entirely new crew, and he stayed aboard for a while as first mate, all the while calling me Roberts. Once the crew believed, he left the ship, and I have been Roberts ever since. Now, I don't have any hard evidence to back up the belief that Lord Hodegraf might have actually been different men, but it could be that this Lord Hodegraf was one in only a long line of Captain's de Graf. But moving on, the second name we need to talk about is Michel de Gramont. If Lorho de Graff dressed the part of the gentleman pirate, Michel de Gramont was actually a proper gentleman, at least according to his legend. He was said to be the son of a nobleman, born in Paris around 1650. But he got into a duel with one of his sister's suitors and killed him, and he was forced to flee his home. Now that's all very much a soap opera, and it's exactly the sort of story a pirate captain might tell to impress the ladies at one tavern or another. Now, that's not to say it's not true, we just don't know what noble family he actually came from. There are some hints of him showing up in Petit Guave and Tortuga, taking smaller prizes, but his name first shows up in that French fleet under Admiral Jean Condé d'Estray. We talked about that last time. Remember, twelve ships of the line, twelve frigates, twelve privateers, fire ships, gunboats, troop transports, and a hospital ship? It was a formidable fleet. It was... The sort of fleet that made the Spanish and Dutch enemies of France tremble with fear. This was the tail end of the Franco-Dutch War, and relations were souring between France and England, which is why Morgan had to worry about that armada. But it was the Dutch that suffered her attentions first. The fleet attacked four Dutch ports in the Leeward Islands, burning every ship in the harbor and occasionally invading. Finally, though, she wrecked off the coast of Venezuela, and the privateers went off to raid elsewhere. Well, Michel de Gramont was one of those privateers in the fleet. Now, if I were truly to do justice to the story of Michel de Gramont, I would devote episodes to him, since his story is really just as fascinating as Henry Morgan's, but it's all wrapped up in that Third Anglo-Dutch-slash-Franco-Dutch war, so I'll just give the highlights. After that fleet wrecked off the coast of Venezuela, Gramont and eleven other ships sailed for the coast. They were well armed by the French crown. They had letters of mark in their possession, and they were under orders to attack the Spanish and Dutch wherever possible. Now, the fleet under Destray had attacked cities and burned ships, but those were naval engagements. They were as honorable as warfare at sea usually got. But Grammont and his companions were privateers. They did things a little bit differently than the Royal Navy. In this instance, they chose to follow in the footsteps of Francois Lolonnais and Henry Morgan. They were going to attack Maracaibo. Now, much like Morgan, Grammont was more of a land-based general than a naval tactician. So he landed the privateers ashore. He had been voted in as their admiral and had more than 2,000 men under his command. He also brought with him a complement of heavy cannon from the ships, so they marched on the city with them. Now, Maracaibo mounted what defense they could but their garrison there was relatively weak against 2,000 men with heavy cannon. Grammont bombarded the city with his cannon, and soon enough they surrendered. Now the people of Maracaibo fled as quickly as possible, including the governor himself. They flooded the roads inland away from the pirates, but still not everyone was able to make it out. One of those unlucky souls wrote, quote, this French enemy was so tyrannical that after taking everything people had, he would torture them unto death, something which not even a Turk nor a Moor would do. End quote. This poor city. The episode we did talking about Lolonais raid on the city was based around the torture of the population. When we talked about Morgan's raid, I compared the Spanish and English sources and pointed out some of the discrepancies, but Morgan also tortured the people there as well. And now, Grammont employed the rack and the lash on the people of Maracaibo. Grammont sent out parties to capture those fleeing on foot, but the governor evaded them, and he was the prized target. So, on June 28, 1678, Michel de Grammont took 1,500 men to follow him inland. Now, they had left about 500 in the town to hold it. 
The closest city was Gibraltar, but they found it already deserted. There were only 21 men in the garrison there to defend the city. So Grimaud left a few men to hold the city, but most of the force continued inland. The closest city of any real size in the region was Trujillo, which was about 50 miles away. The privateers marched for the city, still hauling their guns behind them. Now the garrison there was defended by 350 men, and their own heavy cannon, and many smaller guns. But on September 1st, the French attacked. They bombarded the city ceaselessly, and sent men over the walls in waves from every direction, until Trujillo surrendered. Once again, the entire city fled. They carried their valuables to a city that was about 75 miles to the south. However, the governor was already fled. Grimaud, though, rather than continue chasing the governor, decided that this was a good place to stop and turn back. However, his men did raid the city's churches and warehouses and wealthy homes. They knew they had a 50-mile march ahead of them, though, so they only took the most valuable treasure, and, to be sure, they stripped the larders. They returned first to Gibraltar, and there they stayed for two weeks. This time they took everything of value. Anything that might fetch a decent price back in Petit Guave or Tortuga or maybe Port Royal, they loaded up. They drank every drop of wine in town and ate every scrap of food. But finally, on September 25th, they set the town alight and made for Maracaibo. The pirates stayed there in Maracaibo for much longer. They manned the guns on the fort and positioned their ships to defend the harbor should anyone try to take the city back. But that wasn't really an issue. 2,000 men could defend the city against almost any force the Spanish could raise, at least for a while. So for two months they stayed in town, stripping the city bare. You can imagine this kind of scene. 2,000 drunk, disorderly French pirates as lords of one of the great cities of the West Indies. You can be sure that every day it was spent hard at work searching every nook and hidden trove for treasure, and every night was spent feasting on Maracaibo's food stores. Before long, every man was dressed in a hodgepodge of Spanish finery, once fine boots and coats and feathered hats, but the people in Maracaibo suffered greatly. The Spanish records mention their excesses at length, the torture and murder and desecration of churches, now, once again, the Spanish didn't record it, but we can be sure that untold numbers of women suffered at the hands of the buccaneers in the two months they occupied the city. But finally, on December 3rd, the pirates finished loading up the last of the city's wealth and they sailed away. Now, if you'll remember last time, Governor Carlyle and Henry Morgan went out to meet a small fleet of French pirates off the coast of Jamaica. Remember there was a panic over a Spanish fleet, two ships sailed into Port Royal Harbor, were fired upon, and then the governor and the lieutenant governor had to go out to meet with the invaders. Well, that was this same fleet under Michel de Grammont. They had sailed to Petit Guave and made a fortune off of their haul, and then their fleet split up there on Hispaniola. Grammont now only had seven ships and 700 men with him, but it was still not a small force. There were two familiar names there. William Wright and Thomas Paine, who were English pirates, who we'll meet again when John Cook and William Dampier enter the story in a few years. After Morgan let them collect wood and water there on Jamaica, they headed for the city at Caracas. Now, they took the city easily and made a good haul of treasure and hostages, but then they faced their first defeat when 2,000 Spanish soldiers stormed the beach. The pirates mounted a defense there, but the Spanish heavy guns and horses overwhelmed them pretty quickly. In the retreat, Grimaud was slashed across the neck with a machete and barely survived to make it back to his ship, but he pulled through and they made for a safe harbor to spend some time recovering. When he was well enough to travel, the fleet made for Petit Guave and spent some more time resting, but more importantly, spending their winnings. And it was there in 1682 that Michel de Grammont met the third pirate captain we're going to talk about today. His name was Nicholas von Horn, and he's the member of our trio who was most recently come to the West Indies. He was also Dutch originally, but we don't know much else about his early life. He was short and dark and had an evil air about him, the writers say. But our first records come in October 1681. He was serving as the captain of a ship called the Mary and Martha, a merchantman out of London. 
Now, she was a big ship of about 400 tons with 150 crew and 40 guns, but she was built for trade, not war. She was accompanied by another smaller ship, but of similar size. Now, they were on their way, according to the manifest, to Cadiz, Spain, where they were to do some trading. Now, a 400-ton ship with 40 guns was not there to trade for lumber or dye or even spices. There was only one cargo that a ship that large would be on their way south to trade in. Now, that crew of the Mary and Martha was a mix of Dutch and English sailors. Most of them were respectable men. But before they made it to Spain, they were forced to put in at a French port. Twenty-five men deserted the ship immediately. Later, they wrote that they had realized what kind of a rogue was in charge of their ship. And they were right to do so. Instead of sailing for Cadiz in the south of Spain, where the ships were supposed to be going, Van Horn put in at La Coruna on the northwest coast. He attempted and failed to acquire a license to trade in Spanish America. This was not his mission. You see, he never had any intention of sailing for Cadiz and doing the bidding of some posh, stuffy English businessman. This was his ship now, and he intended to earn his fortune with her, not just some mere wage. But he was denied his license to trade, so he decided to steal four brass swivel guns there and sailed on south. When he told the crew, though, what he intended, well, many of them protested. They weren't pirates, and they weren't about to take part in his piratical crimes. Naturally, the response of Von Horn was to have them violently flogged and put ashore. A total of 36 more men, and the last of the merchants who were unlucky enough to have been put under his care, were finally gone. He sailed on for the Canary Islands, and then on to Cape Verde, before finally landing on the coast of Africa. He didn't have much to trade when he got there, however, so he sold a little bit of his powder and shot, but really just enough to buy supplies. Finally, he came across a ship that made a decent prize. It was a slave ship carrying 100 human beings on board. It was precisely what Van Horn had been looking for. He took that ship to shore and traded with some of the local warlords who traded in slaves. Then he accompanied some of those slavers inland on a mission to capture even more. They captured a total of 600 slaves and brought them back to the coast. But this was all unconventional, even for men who traded in human lives, and Van Horn was exceptionally cruel to his prisoners. So yet more men abandoned Van Horn. They took that other ship which had accompanied him to Africa, along with their entire crew, the men who remained sold some of their slaves there in Africa, but kept most for sale later on. Van Horn then raided a Portuguese outpost, taking a few more slaves and a few more guns, but he had pressed his luck there in Africa and chose to flee for the West Indies. Now, most ships traveling on the trade winds first reached the island of Trinidad, and the Mary and Martha was no different. But Van Horn wasn't able to sell his slaves on Trinidad. All he could do was buy some much-needed food and water. En route from Africa, maybe 200 of his slaves had died through neglect and abuse, so he only had 300 men and women left. Those 300, though, he was contracted to deliver to the Spanish island at Santo Domingo, where he arrived in November 1682. If he expected a warm welcome, well... What he received was an unpleasant one. Upon making landfall, he was arrested, his ship and his slaves were impounded, and all of his crew was put in chains. There were a number of different reasons for this arrest. First of all, he showed up in a Spanish colony, bearing slaves for sale, with no license to trade in either slaves or in Spanish America. Remember, he'd failed to acquire that back in Spain but a few well-placed bribes would usually be enough to circumvent that problem. However, word of his piracies had already reached the West Indies. The Spanish knew of his theft of guns from Spain, they knew of his illegal trading in slaves on the coast of Africa, and they knew of his taking Spanish and Portuguese ships. And it wasn't only the Spanish that knew, the French knew of his crimes, and so did the governor back in Jamaica. That was more than enough reason to see Van Horn arrested, but... It wasn't the only reason. It could be argued that the real reason he was arrested 
was revenge. You see, it was here, only a few weeks after reaching the Caribbean, that Nicholas Van Horn had his first run-in with buccaneering in the Caribbean. He learned his first lesson about just how things were done on this side of the globe. You see, four months earlier, in July 1682, Lorho de Graff caught his first truly great prize. Captain de Graff was there sailing his newly acquired frigate, La Tigra, when he happened upon a singularly rich haul. He was in the Mona Passage between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico when he happened upon the Spanish ship Francesca. She was out of Havana under Captain Manuel Delgado, and when de Graff came upon her, the crew was busy preparing to make landfall. La Tigra came up beside her and opened fire. Now, the crew of the Spanish vessel, Francesca, was well-trained, really an elite crew. They were well-versed in naval battles, so all of the Spanish sailors rushed to man the guns and fired back at La Tigra. The crew of La Francisca fought well. They killed a total of 50 men, which was a full fifth of de Graff's crew of 250, but the pirates fought harder. They sent over a boarding party. That boarding party was met with pistols and sabers, but the French and Dutch pirates fought through that defense until the Spanish finally at length surrendered. The pirates knew just what they would find in the holds of La Francesca, which is why they fought so hard to take her. There was 120,000 pieces of eight in the hold, a king's ransom and fine Spanish silver. Here's the thing, though. That haul, all 120,000 pieces of eight, well, it was bound for Santo Domingo. This was a payroll ship. That payroll was intended for the sailors and soldiers and officials there in Santo Domingo. And that pay was stolen by Lorjo de Graff, a Dutch pirate. And here, just a couple of months later, this other Dutch pirate, Nicholas Van Horn, sails into Santo Domingo without a care in the world. He's got a hold full of slaves. That hold had to be worth at least 120,000 pieces of eight. Plus, they had the privilege of watching him rot in the dungeons. He was arrested for being a Dutchman and a pirate when the Spanish had just been, well, robbed by a Dutchman and a pirate. Now, Van Horn complained loudly of his mistreatment to anyone who would listen. He said the Spanish were petty thieves that they'd stolen his cargo from him. The magistrate replied via a stout messenger with a sturdy lash. The Spanish told Nicholas Van Horn that he could collect his losses from Lorjo de Graff. The pirates there spent a few months in the cells under Santo Domingo. But then, an English pirate hunter, who was sent out from Port Royal by Henry Morgan, recognized the Martha and Mary. He requested permission from the governor at Santo Domingo to bring Van Horn to Jamaica, where he would face trial. But... The Spanish denied him. Then, in the spring of 1683, the crew of the Mary and Martha managed a daring escape. They even found their own ship and sailed off under the cover of darkness. A Spanish customs ship pursued them, but they managed to give her the slip. In short order, the Dutch pirates reached French territory and made for Petit Guave. Now, they petitioned the governor there for redress, and the governor complied. He handed Van Horn a letter of mark against the Spanish. The governor did have one condition, though. If this Dutchman were going out privateering, he had to take another, more experienced privateer along. And the governor knew just who to choose. A man who was a Frenchman, a war hero, a nobleman, even. Michel de Grammont was there in Petit Guave. His neck was healed, and he was busy drowning in wine and women, but... It had been some time since he had been out privateering. So Nicholas Van Horn delivered himself to Grammont, along with his letter of marque, and informed him of the governor's wishes. This was a windfall for Grammont and his men. Letters of marque were hard to come by lately, and a letter against the Spanish, with whom France was technically at peace, well, those were particularly rare and valuable. Nicholas von Horn asked the more experienced pirate exactly where they should sail, where were the best hunting grounds. Michel de Grammont told the Dutchman he was getting ahead of himself, slow down. First, they had to find someone else, another Dutch privateer, the scourge of the West himself, Lorho de Graaf. 
Now next time we'll follow these two in finding de Graff and in everything that follows. But, well, right now is a fitting time to talk about French and Dutch pirates. First of all, this story of these three men is really taking off here in 1683, but on a larger macro level, the balance of power back in Europe was shifting in 1683. That shift happened along an axis between the French and the Dutch, but more than just happening between the French and the Dutch, it was happening between the Bourbon dynasty, who was closely allied with the House of Stuart in England, and the Habsburg dynasty, which meant the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, and the Netherlands. In a couple of episodes, we're going to discuss all of the wars and treaties and alliances, marriages and political maneuvering that was shaping things back in Europe. But next time I want to focus on the pirates. However, it's important to realize that through this entire story of the French and the Dutch and their power struggles, Louis XIV was the most powerful man in the world, and he was throwing his weight around. That French fleet threatening Jamaica, that was King Louis's doing. Michel de Gramont was one of those great French buccaneers. Lorho de Graff and Nicolas von Horn, well, they were Dutch, but they were carrying French commissions and working on the instructions of the Sun King. Jacob Evertsen and his ship, they were Dutch pirates sailing under French colors. That anonymous crew that Morgan invited into his home last time back in Jamaica, well, at this point we can assume that they were probably Dutch pirates sailing under French colors. There were dozens of other privateer vessels menacing the English and the Dutch and the Spanish, both their ships and their cities, and they were all working for France. This period, the early 1680s, after the Franco-Dutch War, sees France becoming, in many ways, like England back in the late 1660s, a hive of pirate activity. King Louis was unparalleled in his power back in Europe, and he wanted to translate that power into the New World. So, remember that everything that's happening here, all of these raids, they're privateer expeditions. They're backed by the full authority of Louis the Fourteenth, and they're part of a much larger game being played across the world.